Hello, hello, hello. I welcome you back to Pastor B's Kitchen Table. I thank you that you took the opportunity and you accepted the invite to come back to the table. I pray you've already contacted your mama and them and your daddy and them and all the nims in your circle. That This is the table. This is where we break it down and put it back together again for the glory of God. And I am glad to have a guest above all guests today. We have with us today Attorney Brian Middleton. Attorney Middleton, will you say hello? Tell us who you are and what you do. Hello, Pastor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of your program. Uh, I am the district attorney for Fort Bend County. I was elected uh, in 2018, November 2018, and became the, the first African-American uh, elected as district attorney for Fort Bend County and the first uh, African-American to, along with some others at the same time, but to be elected uh, since Reconstruction countywide. So we, we ended a, uh, a long tradition in Fort Bend County. Wow, that's amazing. Now, Attorney, if you would, just for our guest viewers, can you tell us exactly what is a district attorney and what does a district attorney do? Yes, uh, what the district attorney uh, does is I'm responsible, my office is responsible for the prosecution of all criminal charges in Fort Bend County. And that ranges from uh, Class C misdemeanors, which might be a speeding ticket, running a stop sign that's issued by a, a, a county officer, all the way up to capital murder. So it's a wide variety of cases that we handle. Uh, but, uh, you know, police officers arrest people and they file the cases with this office for prosecution. So uh, we're the gatekeepers for justice in this community because uh, we decide um, we accept or reject all arrests uh, in Fort Bend County. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You accept it. Okay, that's that is so good to know. One of your platforms when you were running for election, now that you're there, one of your vision ideas was related to juvenile justice reform. Can you tell us exactly what you had in mind for that, and where are you right now on that? Well, you know, um, that was a part of my vision is to 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 improve the, the criminal justice system, and in particular with juveniles, uh, is often talked about uh, a uh, syndrome, a, a uh, problem within the criminal justice system that they describe as the uh, school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, and what it is, in basically in a nutshell, is that certain, certain groups, certain minorities, uh, have a, have had historically a higher representation in the juvenile justice system, have had more encounters with uh, juvenile detention in juvenile courts, which leads to a correlation between them going on into the adult criminal justice system. Uh, there have been some experts who looked at it and, and see that there is a correlation uh, between their involvement in the juvenile justice system and their uh, graduation into the adult system. So really what it means is that you have some kids who commit some infractions that may be minor. Uh, they become acclimated to the criminal justice system and they end up on a different trajectory than they would have otherwise. So you have good kids who get put into the system and they get led astray and end up on a track uh, that ultimately leads them into the adult criminal justice system. And so I came in with the vision of changing that. Uh, there are a lot of things that the school district should be handling on an administrative level. So we came in and made some policies, policy changes to assure that some of these low level offenses are not being criminalized and be handled, uh, would be handled and have been handled now uh, by the school districts. Uh, a lot of the things that I would have gone to the principal's office for when I was growing up, now mm -hmm. kids end up in court. So we've come up with a system uh, of, of informal uh, probation. So in, in the juvenile system, that's what we call it. But uh, these kids, uh, first offender program, they, they come in and instead of going through the court process, they receive services and would address any issues that they have without putting them through the criminal justice system. Uh, and that is one of the efforts in trying to 
uh, eliminate the, the school to prison pipeline. Um, also, charging appropriately, um, not overcharging juveniles. What the family code requires us to do and the court system to do is to try to rehabilitate rehabilitate each child that comes into the system. So we're focusing on placements uh, and services and making sure the kids who we have to put through the system are being treated appropriately and getting the services that we that they need. But the, the biggest thing is not sending kids through the, the system unnecessarily. I mean, you can have some kids who engage in pro-social uh, behavior, otherwise who, you know, end up doing some mischief and then they get into the system and they introduce to this criminal element and then they're corrupted um, and the pattern just goes on. So we're trying to, trying to prevent that from happening. Um, and I'm fortunate to have uh, some very qualified individuals working in the juvenile justice, I mean, juvenile uh, division in my office and uh, have been working real hard. We also have a uh, committee that's comprised of uh, uh, community partners who are helping us navigate through these, these changes and, and making suggestions. So we've been very, very active in uh, juvenile justice reform. Hey man, that, that, that is so good to hear, attorney, because as you know, in some regards, some may say that you're actually swimming upstream in, in doing that. You're kind of going against the current. And I say that because you remember back in 2010, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. And, right. and her premise in that was about this whole mass incarceration. Right. That one, the one reason why so many are put into the pipeline and many are overcharged is because we really need that prison labor. And so, and so we've got to have the, the, the population there. So it allows to achieve our greater end, which, which of course at the end of it is always some kind of financial incentive. And so what type of receptive receptivity have you received and trying to, to you know, to, to, to kind of be the antithesis of what existed before you? Yeah, the, I mean, I, I've received some resistance, but it hadn't stopped me from pursuing these changes. And I think what the community has discovered is that, you know, the sky didn't fall. You know, everybody was saying, if you do this, then, yeah. you know, uh, crime rate is going to go up. And, and what we've seen consistently in this county and across the nation is that these progressive changes actually have positive results. You don't see an increase in incarceration. You see a reduction in recidivism. Uh, we save costs, we save money. You know, um, the United States is an outlier in terms of mass incarceration. We lead the world in mass incarceration. Uh, we have been on a trajectory uh, that we cannot maintain this pace. We can't afford it from a cost taxpayer standpoint, nor from a human uh, rights standpoint. And so I think all the stakeholders are in agreement, including our President Trump, who championed the the uh, the First Step Act on the federal level, which is was 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 is a uh, kind of a, a robust uh, uh, bill that was passed that had a lot of different elements, but one of the main ones was an ability for a lot of people who received these mandatory minimum sentences under drug laws on the federal court level they can come in and have their sentences reduced back down to uh, current standards of what would be appropriate. So we've seen around the nation people being released from federal prison uh, okay. under the First Step Act. Uh, he championed it uh, and was very proud of it when, you know, in, in, in signing that law and advertising the first African-American who, the first person who received the benefit of that was an African-American and he made a big deal out of it. I'm mentioning all this so people can understand that it is, it's not uh, a partisan issue. It's not a black and white issue. This is a human rights issue. Exactly. That I think uh, people involved in the process understand, okay, look, uh, we've gone way too far in the wrong direction. And it's time to reevaluate, re recalculate, and, and start doing things uh, differently because you know i'm a big proponent that when we know better we should do better right. and so i think collectively uh the nation and in the in the 
leaders in criminal justice have identified this and uh, have been making, probably not as quickly as we would like, but have been making progressive changes. Uh, another important thing is that Texas leads the nation in criminal justice reform. I attend seminars across the nation and is, is widely recognized that Texas has led the nation uh, in, criminal, in implementing criminal justice reforms. And partly uh, the reason for that is there's been some emphasis on Texas to make these changes because the traditional wisdom is, is that so goes, goes Texas, so does the rest of the nation. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, a, Texas was targeted uh, and it's been successful. And we are a leader in the nation and, and we see other states following, you know, our lead and implementing these different changes. So I, I think we're really fortunate. Now, nothing's perfect. We're not a perfect system, uh, but the, the, the will is there now. And that has intensified since the George Floyd incident. And we've seen greater, more intense discussion and, and, and more buy-in uh, from what I would call the opposition or, or resistance. So mm -hmm. I think we have a lot of momentum and I think we're, we're, we're forging ahead towards greater reform, meaningful change. Attorney, tell me now about bail reform because we want to know how do we get our cousins and uncles and nephews and nieces out of jail. Tell me, tell me what's going on with that. Okay. Uh, there was an, uh, the, what we call the Donald decision that was a uh, result of litigation in Harris County. Harris County courts were sued because of uh, disparities in their, in their bail system. Uh, and the county lost and it was appealed to the Court of Appeals, which is the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals issued a order declaring uh, their system unconstitutional and made recommendations on the changes that need to be made. Uh, the changes were in the nature of the cash bail system. Uh, typically in the criminal justice system, we've had bond schedules and you know, if you charge with X, then this is what your bond should be. That's one of the things that the Fifth Circuit declared was unconstitutional, is that you have to look at these cases on an individual basis. Uh, and another part of the suit was that the, the you cannot use cash uh, to, to hold people in jail uh, hmm. pending trial. The uh, determination has to be on what the Constitution in the, in the, in the um, Texas law requires, which is you have to look at future dangerousness. You have to look uh, whether or not they are a flight risk. So those are the considerations that should be made. Uh, you also have to take into account the ability to, to, uh, to afford posting a bond because bond, according to the United States constitution cannot be used as a punishment. So, uh, you know, all this is based on, uh, the premise in our constitution that people are presumed innocent. So when people pre-trial are charged with a crime, uh, what's required by the O'Donnell system is that you have a system that considers their future dangerousness, their flight risk, uh, and their ability to post a bond in that consideration. And so it has effectively outlawed, um, outlawed, uh, bond schedules and requires the courts to make individual termination uh, and use uh, personal recognizance bonds. So people who cannot afford bail uh, mm -hmm. have an opportunity to get out of jail. Now, uh, when I, I talk to people who are opposed to it, they think it's, it's unfair, but I can tell you, usually the worst criminals have a lot of money. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have some uh, gang member, or someone in the, in the mafia or some other uh, organized crime group, they've got a lot of cash. And so they're able to post these high bonds and get out of jail. Then you have, you compare that to someone that's, uh, what I say, your, your average person who works for a living, uh, having to come up with $10,000 cash uh, in a short uh, time period would be difficult. And so you could have someone, a family man that gets charged with DWI who's unable to afford a bond and will sit in jail pending trial 
Whereas you have a hardened, dangerous criminal who's got a lot of cash and ability to pay who gets out. Now, the community is, is not safer under those circumstances. And so bail, removing cash bail is, is, um, is a good thing. Uh, another thing that people don't typically are not aware of is that the federal government has used this system for, for decades. And no one has, you know, uh, complained about the federal system. Uh, historically, the federal courts have looked at your dangerousness, and sometimes they deny bond because of your dangerousness. Uh, sometimes they require a higher cash bond because of your dangerousness. So this, these reforms are not anything new. They're just new to the state. They've been used and exercised on the federal level for, for decades. Okay, okay. So let me see if I can, if I can kind of <clears throat> scale that down a little bit. What you're saying is that previously bail or bonds were used in somewhat of a form of a punishment. That if there was someone who we wanted to make an example out of or someone we wanted to keep, we would just put a, a bail knowing that there's no way in which they can, they can, they can achieve this bail. And they, they can't raise the cash. And therefore, their court date may be a year or two years off. They just sit in the county jail during that time, as opposed to someone else. So you're saying maybe a, a white collar criminal or someone who has means, or, or there may be ill gotten gains. Uh, they 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 have the, the resource. They they have the pipeline of resource. They can just walk out on that day or the next day. And so you're saying that that's that's the reform. So you're trying to do it based on a case by case situation. That's correct. The only nuance that I would say, and this is what I, I've been trying to educate the people in Fort Bend County, is that um, I agree with these principles, but these are not just my ideas. This is required by law. The Fifth Circuit is over all these courts in, in, within that region, which includes Texas. So we're bound by that decision. We're bound by what the Fifth Circuit determined in the O'Donnell case. So this is not optional for us. We have to comply with the United States Constitution by that order. So whether people like it or not, we're under uh, uh, a court order to implement these changes. So I think whether we should, we've already passed. It's right. just how quickly can we do it uh, is really the question now. So why was it able to skirt under the radar for so long? If you're saying that this has already been legislated, this is a law, then why is that now it's, it's communicated as a reform, but it's really just the execution of what's already been mandated. So why did it skirt for so long? Well, you know, traditional wisdom or traditional uh, thought process was that people who are charged with crimes ought to stay in jail. You know, it's okay. just like, oh, you got arrested for, for uh, a serious crime, you should stay in jail while you wait in trial. Well, that's kind of, well, it's not kind of, it is counter our, our tenets, it's counter uh, all our values, you know, American values and in, in, in the constitution that we're presumed innocent. Uh, it's, it's against our, our, our values because it's, it's the dehumanization. Mm -hmm. uh, people are presumed innocent. And just because people are arrested, they don't lose their humanity and they certainly don't lose their constitutional rights. Right. And so we, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a part of that structural racism that the, the new Jim Crow is talking about, right. is that we've had to peel back those layers to get to it and we've had to have these court challenges to address it. Because unfortunately, I think a lot of people, even minorities have been kind of sort of, uh, uh, ill-advised in, 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 in supporting these different types of concepts uh, because, you know, it's just traditional wisdom. But we know better now, and I think that's part of the change is that there's been a progressive movement uh, to make sure that, that we uphold uh, our tenets and uh, our beliefs and our values because for a long time we've had double standards, and that's what uh, we see and we call racism because there's yeah. always been one set of rules for one group and a different set of rules yeah, for yeah, right. another group. Yeah. So it, it's a reckoning. You know, our nation is growing up. Uh, I think there has been an awakening over the last couple of decades and certainly in the last couple of months 
that we are not holding true to our values. You know, we, we pledge allegiance. We say one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. But, you know, when has that been true in our country? I mean, and that's, we're struggling right now with an identity crisis, uh, trying to eliminate double standards and, and uphold our tenets, you know? Right, 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 right. Something that's been in the very fabric uh, and, and, and really in the soil of our land. And it's that's been right. there uh, forever. Uh, one of the things that, that you talked about George Floyd earlier, and you talked about, you know, the, the actual systemic racism. And one thing that came out of all that we heard about something called defunding the police. Right. And of course, what was communicated and what was heard and what was just were, were, were in total opposition because people assumed that it meant get rid of all the police. But that's really not what they were communicating. Now, you're the district attorney in a great prosperous area like Fort Bend County. Uh, what does that mean to you? And how do you respond to something like that? This, uh, this concept of defunding the police. Yeah, you know, I, I never liked that terminology because it, it, it suggests that we need to get rid of police and that's never yeah. the case. Um, you know, we need police. We need a criminal justice system to maintain civility. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we can't have civilization without having law enforcement. So I, I don't support eliminating police. So I think what's being trying to be communicated uh, with people who support the defunding of police is the reappropriation of certain funds. Yeah, yeah. Now, when we talk about Fort Bend County, I can tell you, even my department, we're underfunded. Uh, we have a lot of small police departments in Fort Bend County. Our largest one is the Sheriff's Department. And, and we've been operating with, with shortages for years. So we don't have a lot of excess to, to cut. Right. Uh, I think for defunding the police, in, in my opinion, it should be uh, redesignating the role of police. I mean, it's particularly like with uh, mental health, like we have a uh, crisis intervention team, a CIT team, which was very progressive uh, in, in its, uh, its intent, its purpose, and how it's been carried out, because these officers are in this division are particularly uh, trained on how to deal with the mentally ill. So uh, regular patrol officers out on the scene responding to a call for service and, and recognizes this mental illness involved, they can call this CIT unit to come out and address the situation. And it prevents these persons from unnecessarily being put into the criminal justice system when the real problem is mental illness. And so, when we talk about defunding the police, I would like to see an increase in funding in these type of programs to, to divert the mentally ill away from the criminal justice system. Also would like to see more funds used to create community policing. Um, you know, because unfortunately, usually when we deal with the police, it's, it's under bad circumstances. There should be more community involvement, uh, more community-based programs. You know, when I was growing up, my first encounter with police was with uh, officer friendly program. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had this positive memories, positive interaction with, with the police officer at an early age. And so programs like that need to be increased. Uh, and particularly with uh, school officers is that they should not just be, you know, uh, disciplined enforcers. They should have an active role in these, kids life in school so they can have positive experiences because I think a lot of what we see right now is the the mistrust or the distrust between the minority communities and law enforcement because of the history in this country and so if we can reestablish some trust because the issues on both sides and if we can get back to discussion and try to reestablish trust in both the communities then I think we can eliminate some of the systemic problems that we see. But that's gonna require uh, a lot of reform. It's gonna have to require a change in mindset. And, and you know, why I'm talking about the kids is that, you know, recently I had, I've been involved with youth and I've discovered some of them have a negative impression about law enforcement, but they've had zero interaction with law enforcement. So right. I'm like, 
you've never been arrested, you never talked to a police officer, you never been detained, but you don't like police. And I realize that's, you know, that's because of what they, they're reading and what they're seeing going mm -hmm. on. And so I suspect if they had positive interaction with police, then they probably wouldn't feel that way. And I feel like if the police officers, uh, like it used to be, is that, you know, everybody, there were certain police officers, everybody knew. You know, if, if, if uh, Smitty, Officer Smitty came by, everybody was like, hey, Smitty came by, you know, and talked to us and he was hanging out with us at the, at the basketball court. When something's going wrong, Smitty can go talk to the community and get to the bottom of it. And people will feel comfortable calling uh, an officer like that and, and, mm -hmm. and, and seeking assistance. So we got to get back to taking care of each other. Um, you know, what I like to see is police officers take off their guns and their badges and go into the community and talk to people as human beings. Uh, so there is a restored uh, recognition that they're dealing with humans and more humanity involved in the process. So people aren't so afraid and quick to pull a trigger. People are not getting so hostile when they have an interaction with police officers. So, you know, I, I see the solution uh, involving uh, reform on both sides. What are you asking the church and the community to do to really change this narrative? Because, you know, this whole, as you said, this, this gap of trust, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a genuine distrust, what you were saying earlier about the kid who never had any history with the criminal justice system. And yet I guarantee he's been around a table and he heard community, certainly sees on videos and sees on television, but he also has heard some conversations. Right now, perhaps he didn't hear the whole story related to all that happened, but he knows someone that's been in the system. And so how do you, what, what would you desire from the church? What would you desire from the community to kind of start this whole bridge of trust being built? You know, what I really think is, 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 uh, is needed from the church is, um, you know, I just got to pause for a second because um, after this George Floyd incident, um, it had a, a deep impact on me. I feel like, uh, I was broken almost. Um, like a whole lot of African Americans, I did a lot of crying, a lot of soul searching, because uh, it was painful to see my image, you know, being murdered like that. Uh, and and just the realization that the struggle, we hadn't seen like we hadn't gone too far since yeah, the yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Jim Crow era. And so, getting deep in thought, you know, I started realizing that there's nothing in our system, in our laws or in our, or in our values that condones that. And so I realized, hey, look, you know, I've been using the term fake Christians is that we have not been living up to God's word. We have not been true to our beliefs and, and we don't need new laws we need people to be authentic. We need people to not tolerate double standards. We need people to 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 pray and to and to act in accordance with God's word. So, what I like to see the church do is to 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 speak to people about double standards and, and living up to God's word and practicing what you preach. Uh, people really need to look in the mirror and and ask themselves, you know. Are my words and actions in agreement? Uh, because I think everyone, including myself, ha have not been uh, fulfilling God's word and have not been consistent. Uh, and we need to make a greater effort in trying to follow the word of God and in being good people. Uh, because I think, you know, what is a good person? You know, if you just follow God's word, I mean, you are the epitome, in my uh, opinion, a good person. Uh, and that's what we teach all the time, but we're, we're not seeing it in our culture. Yeah. So I think I would, I, I would love to see the church uh, hold people accountable and, and, and preach that we need to stop the hypocrisy. Uh, we need to eliminate double standards, and we don't need to be silent. We need to be who we claim we are. And yeah. stop being fake Christians, you know. I'm, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. That may yeah, be a little I, bit harsh, but 
No, I, I follow what you're saying exactly, Attorney, because unfortunately for so many, and even in the kingdom, is that the culture means more than Christ. Right. Whatever their culture is, that's what they want. And so what you see is really an affirmation and a digging in of this is my culture. And so my, but yet through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Christ comes first because the things about our culture may not be righteous, may not be godly, but Christ is our example because that's where the love and the sacrifice and the humility and the forgiveness and the equality that all come through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so if we're willing to put Christ first and not our culture and not even the color of our skin, uh, th then we're on the road to something. But only, that's why I say the church has the answer. Uh, but we, we've got to carry it out in the midst of being antagonized and in the midst of saying that there are people who say they're Christians, but I like what you said. They're really, they may be cultural Christians, but they're not biblical Christians. That's the difference. And I want you to know that, that and I say as a pastor that whatever we can do, because I love your vision. I've, I've always had this thing about when it comes to criminal justice, my, my uncle was a police officer. And so and my, my brother's in the military. So I understand that God instituted according to Romans 13, he instituted government and, and how it should work. And so I'm all for that. But I've always had this idea with government is, I mean, I mean, the legal system, the judicial system is always about punishment. There has to be reform. There has to be, everyone's life is not over because they've got to spend, you know, time in the county jail, time in the TDC. There's got to be life after incarceration for our young people, our older people, our middle-aged men and women. So whatever I can do, Pat, I mean, uh, attorney, what I can do to help you create these initiatives, I'm certainly open to that uh, because there's got to be a way that the church can partner and help those, and like what you said, who as opposed to them having the, the tougher sentences, they just need accountability, they need an example, they need help. Uh, and so we could do both arms of this thing. And so whatever we can do with the church here at Friendship, uh, let's talk about that. In fact, I spoke to a judge one time who's also in Fort Bend County about he had this idea for youth, for, for rehabilitation for youth. And so we talked about some things and I think that's the key. But it, it, it can't just be a prison pipeline. It can't just be punishment. There's gotta be a partnership for, because life, life matters. And we gotta, be able to, we gotta be able to heal. We gotta be able to help people to heal. I think that's what the church does. Um, you've got an awesome job, my brother. You've got an awesome job. You sit in a, in a, in a, in a, in a very decorated chair. Uh, and yet I, I, I can only imagine the warfare you have to deal with uh, by not only being the district attorney, because most people who are probably watching this right now have never had a conversation with a district attorney under favorable circumstances. Many have not. Uh, and so for you to sit there and be able to articulate what you've articulated is just so encouraging uh, to my soul and to our community. My last question for you is, 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 is simply this. Is it possible for someone who has uh, crossed the line, gone the right, wrong way, and they've got a record, criminal record, what's the process for getting their record expunged? Okay. Um, one of the things is going to depend on the disposition of the case. If they have been convicted and they've got a final conviction, then the only way to, to remove that would be a pardon from the government. Uh, but if you uh, received a deferred adjudication, then there's a, de there's a process to have your, your record uh, sealed. Okay. Uh, if you've gone to trial or you had your case dismissed, then you may be eligible for an expunction. Um, we have a number of diversion programs which are designed for first offenders, uh, low-level offenders uh, who show themselves, you know, uh, willing to uh, conform their, you know, behavior. Um, we offer them a diversion program which allows them to avoid a final conviction. And at the end, if they successfully complete all the terms and conditions of the diversion, then they will receive an expunction. It's not offered to everyone, but the people who show themselves worthy of it. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's basically really, uh, it has to do with the background and your willingness to, to abide by the conditions of the diversion programs. We don't offer that to, to violent offenders, uh, but we have provided a process so people can move on with their lives. Because one of the things that we're looking at 
in the criminal justice system uh, holistically is alternatives to incarceration. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we've noticed in other criminal justice systems is that they have a greater emphasis on what you described, which is reentry. Uh, you can reduce recidivism if you can have persons, you know, accept responsibility held accountable and then have them be able to come out and live a productive life if if you cannot have a means of supporting yourself then people tend to uh fall back into their old behavior so it's very critical to to be successful in the criminal justice system is allow people an opportunity to live a, a normal productive life and that's when yeah. churches come into play in helping with rehabilitation yeah, yeah, thank you. Cause, because one of the vision of our church is a place to begin again. Is that right. no matter where you've been, what you've done, why you did it and everything, God through Jesus Christ wants to give you a chance to begin again, that you can become a committed follower of Jesus Christ. So I thank you so much, Attorney Milton, for today and really just putting a face on this and being so personable, or so truthful, so clear. You've educated us, you've encouraged us because you know many times in our community, the perception is that lady justice is for sale. That, that, that in fact, this whole criminal justice system comes down to dollars and cents. If you got the money, you can get off. If you don't have the money, you gotta go and you gotta stay and you gotta stay for a long time. Uh, and I thank you for what, you're, for what you're doing and what you've said. And I really meant what I said about I wanna partner. I wanna, what, what can we do Absolutely. Uh, to, to be an ally? Because there are people who need to begin again. I don't care about the color. I don't care about the economical situation. They need to begin again. So whatever I can do and we can do, we want to do it together. But I pray God will bless you and God will keep you uh, as you go forward and make some tough, tough decisions. May God watch over you and your household. So there, there it is, guests, uh, here at the kitchen table. You've heard it. I want you to call your family together and let them hear today from a district attorney, Attorney Middleton. He broke it down for us. Read it. Talk about it. Listen to it. Replay it again. And I want to look forward to seeing you again next Friday right here at the kitchen table. God bless you. God keep you. And most of all, may you let God use you.